Hello, my name is Matthias Roth. I'm a professor of urban climatology in the Department of Geography at the National University of Singapore, and I'm going to present the second part of Essential Elements of Urban Climatology for Understanding the Urban Heat Island Effect, which highlights the different types of urban heat islands and their spatial temporal characteristics and the most commonly used observation approaches. It is a not always appreciated fact that there are different types of urban heat islands, and each type has its own characteristics, their own behavior, scale dependence, and hence method of observation, and also range or scope of application. A simple classification is given here where four types are distinguished as illustrated from bottom to top on the schematic on the right. The subsurface urban heat island is the difference between temperature patterns in the ground underneath the city and those in the surrounding rural ground. It is a local scale phenomenon. The surface urban heat island is the temperature difference at the interface of the atmosphere with the materials of the city and the ground air interface of the rural area. Ideally, the urban interface includes all surface facets making up the so-called complete surface. It is a microscale phenomenon. The canopy layer urban heat island is the difference between the temperature of the air contained in the urban canopy layer, which is defined as the layer between the urban surface and the mean roof level, and the air temperature at an equivalent height above the surrounding rural ground. It is a local or neighborhood scale phenomenon. Finally, the boundary layer of urban heat island is the difference between the temperature of the air in the layer between the top of the urban canopy layer and the top of the urban boundary layer, and the corresponding air temperature in the rural pl uh, planetary boundary layer. It is a local to mesoscale phenomenon and can be observed as a plume of warm urban air transported downwind of a city. So why the term heat island? It derives from similarities between the spatial pattern of nighttime isotherms of air temperature in the urban canopy layer and height contours on topographic maps. This analogy works well for the subsurface, the surface and the boundary layer heat islands during day and night, but for the canopy layer heat island usually only for nighttime, since daytime air temperatures across the city are less pronounced. This slide summarizes some of the main characteristics of the air temperature heat island in the canopy layer. It is by far the most commonly studied heat island type with a long history going back to 1833 when Duke Howard measured higher temperatures in the city of London, UK than in its surrounding countryside. Every settlement has a heat island, be it a small village of only 1,000 inhabitants or a megacity with over 10 million people. There is always a close relationship between urban development and the thermal pattern, but the pattern is unique for every city. The heat island map on the right-hand side for the city of London displays the close relationship between the built-up area and air temperature, with a maximum found in the city center and decreasing temperatures towards its fringes. The island pattern of isotherms referred to earlier can be nicely seen in this example. The heat island morphology often includes a cliff, plateau, hill, valley, and peak features, as illustrated on the schematic on the bottom right-hand side. For any heat island type, the heat island magnitude or intensity is defined as the sustained maximum urban temperature minus a representative temperature of the rural surrounding. So as shown on the schematic, delta T sub UR equals Tu minus Tr. So what causes the heat island and what does its magnitude depend on? Both the diurnal urban and rural temperature waves have a certain amplitude, but the amplitude in the rural area is greater. And this difference in amplitude is primarily due to differences in urban and rural nighttime temperatures. While daytime air temperature maxima are often similar in urban and rural environments, the nocturnal minimum temperature in the rural area is much lower compared to that measured in the city. The top panel on the figure to the right shows the diurnal cores of average urban and rural air temperatures measured in the city center of Singapore and a relatively undeveloped area outside the city. 
the time scale on the x-axis starts at 12 noon and again stops at 12 noon the next day. Hence the shaded area in the center of the figure denotes nighttime between sunset and sunrise. In this particular case, the urban daytime maximum is slightly larger, but as expected, the rural nighttime minimum is much lower. This means that afternoon cooling rates are smaller in urban and rural areas, as shown in the middle panel. These different afternoon and evening cooling rates set up a nighttime temperature difference, which is the heat island magnitude, as shown on the bottom panel. Maximum heat island magnitudes are usually reached in the first half of the night or towards the end of the night. The urban heat island is therefore primarily a nighttime phenomenon. The magnitude of the heat island depends on various factors, such as wind speed, because high wind speed will reduce spatial temperature gradients and increase thermal transport of heat away from the warm surface. It depends on cloudiness, because the amount of clouds disproportionately controls how much nighttime co uh, cooling can occur over the rural area, as opposed to the urban area where the sky view is already restricted. And it depends on moisture conditions in the rural area because moist vegetated surfaces have a higher thermal emittance compared to dry ones, which reduces their nighttime cooling potential. The largest canopy layer urban heat island intensities are therefore likely to occur on calm, clear nights during the dry season. Next, let's have a look at the surface temperature heat island. Although similarities exist, the situation here is slightly different. Considering surface temperatures, urban areas stand out from the surrounding landscape both by day and night. Many such examples, like the one included on the right-hand side, exist. Shown here is a nighttime thermal image of Paris captured by the NOAA AVHRR sensor. The main characteristics of surface temperature heat islands include consistently positive correlations between surface temperature and impervious surface fraction, and strongly negative relations between surface temperature and vegetated surface fraction. Both of these features can also be seen on the thermal image to the right, where the two urban forests, Bois de Boulogne and Bois de Vincennes, on the thermal image show up as areas with uh, relatively lower surface temperatures, and the Charles de Gaulle airport, with its expansive paved surfaces, has higher surface temperatures. So generally during daytime, the hottest areas are associated with light industrial areas, warehouses, transport infrastructure, whereas heavily vegetated areas, especially those with tree canopies, have lower daytime surface temperatures. And the coolest areas are those of water bodies and well-watered vegetation. During nighttime, the commercial and city center districts are warmest, Roads also remain warm, and the vegetated open parks with grass and well-watered vegetated surfaces are coolest. Various surface properties are responsible for the highly variable surface temperature features observed in cities. These surface properties include geometric properties, uh, such as the orientation of a facet or the openness to the sky and sun of a facet or a situation, radiative properties, such as albedo and emissivity, thermal properties in terms of thermal conductivity and heat capacity of a surface facet, and the moisture situation at the surface, which controls the heat loss via the latent heat flux. The aerodynamic uh, properties, such as roughness, are also important in determining, determining the um, local surface temperature. Uh, there is an endless mix of these properties in the urban context, hence the spatial variability of surface temperature is much higher than that of air temperature, which is illustrated on the figure to the, on the, on the right-hand side here, which shows a great variability of surface temperatures associated with different facets of this scene. And, um, very local scale, micro scale differences in surface temperatures of up to 13 degrees C can be observed. So the surface urban heat island is a micro scale phenomenon, which is unlike the canopy layer urban heat island, which represents the local scale. 
While causes and processes in the generation of the various heat island types are of course connected, important differences exist and they are illustrated here for the surface and canopy layer heat islands. The typical temperature variability across the hypothetical city is shown in the illustration on the right hand side for both surface and air temperatures, shown by solid and dashed lines respectively, and day and night differentiated by red and blue colors. What we can see is that there is greater variability in surface temperature compared to air temperature in response to the larger variability in surface properties. This is especially so during daytime. And during daytime, the surface temperatures of all surface facets are usually higher than the air temperature in the urban canopy layer, ex except for water bodies or wet surfaces. At night, the surface temperatures of roofs are usually lower than the air temperature in the urban canopy layer. These differences seen are an outcome of the fact that the surface urban heat island represents an immediate temperature response at the scale of facets to inputs and outputs of energy. On the other hand, the canopy layer urban heat island response is slower and blending contributions of nearby surfaces and anthropogenic heat within the urban canopy layer and also incorporates advected contributions from the neighborhood. Hence, it is very important not to confuse the satellite-derived surface urban heat island with the canopy layer urban heat island, since they measure different thermal responses at different scales. In my final section, I will briefly talk about ways to measure different heat island types, and I will concentrate on those types which have more applied value when considering heat mitigation or outdoor thermal comfort. With respect to the surface heat island, there are two main types, one based on the true 3D surface temperature, and another one based on the more common bird's eye 2D surface temperature using sensors mounted on, for example, an airplane, helicopter, or satellite. Generally, the surface heat island provides spatially continuous measurements of surface temperature across the city and hence is able to sample the vast range of urban facets and materials. But it depends on the timing of the satellite overpass, which may not coincide with the time of maximum heat island development or the time of desired application. Of consideration is also the viewing angle. Sensors with near nadir angles are biased to horizontal surfaces since they neglect unseen surfaces underneath trees and or vertical walls. So this is the typical 2D view. On the other hand, it is the complete 3D surface temperature which is the key variable in modeling the urban energy exchange, building heat demand or thermal comfort. Regarding the canopy layer heat island, we can distinguish between measurements at fixed stations carried out at screen level that is about 1.5 to 2 meters above ground, or from traverses. The former is the simplest way to measure the canopy layer urban heat island over time on a routine basis. Air temperature can be measured in a weather screen or ventilated radiation shield at one or more sites, befitting a certain purpose and ideally considered representative of urban and rural local climate zones. Traverses are recommended for spatial surveys to monitor the canopy layer heat island using a sensor mounted on a vehicle. This could be a car, train, bicycle. This approach provides insights into the small-scale spatial variability. The next two slides provide examples for each of the two canopy layer heat island approaches from Singapore. First illustrates the setup of a low-cost fixed station sensor network which was used to monitor the heat island during multiple years at up to 40 stations. The sensors were installed to be representative of a particular local neighborhood or local climate zone. Shown here are examples of five stations representing clockwise from top right, compact mid-rise, compact low-rise, compact high-rise, large low-rise and scattered tree categories. Such a continuous long-term monitoring network allows the analysis of diurnal and seasonal temperature and heat island patterns, and the influence of weather on these patterns when supplemented by wind and cloud data from regular weather stations. The Traverse approach is illustrated here. In this particular case, a temperature sensor is mounted on a vehicle and driven along a fixed traverse route to sample the variability across different neighborhoods. 
again classified according to their respective local climate zones. The temperature trace shows the large small-scale variability along the route. Significant temperature differences exist between the various neighborhoods with the lowest temperature observed in the rural area with scattered trees and the highest temperature is in the, found in the commercial city center. The heat and intensity during this particular traverse was about 4 degrees C. The traverse approach is of course not suitable to monitor long-term heat island dynamics across an entire city, but given its high spatial resolution, it can be used to support the selection of long-term monitoring sites. So this brings me to the end of my section and my last slide. I've listed here the references quoted on the previous slides for anyone interested in further details. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to any questions you may have.